excited. We're, we're back in Genesis, obviously, which is going to be great. We went through Genesis 1 through 11 in the fall, and then we took our break for Advent, and now we're going to be back into it this morning. And in a moment, I'll read the passage from um, Genesis chapter 12. If you want to start turning there, if you're going to follow along, Genesis chapter 12 is where we're going to be. Um, but let me just say, anytime we're in God's word, it's, it's a good message for us, anytime. But this message, the way that things have lined up, I think is just going to be a really timely message as we look towards this new year and as we all ask the question of how God is leading us as a church, us as families, and us as individuals into new steps of faith. And so as we get ready to read the passage, I just want to invite you to approach it that way, to approach this through what is the new thing that God is calling me to that feels uncomfortable <laughs> but it's going to end up paying off in the end because God is trustworthy. Um, and so I'm going to start. I'm going to read through our passage. It's Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 9. If you, don't have, if you do have a Bible, go ahead and turn there because I'll allude to some things throughout the surrounding verses. Um, but if you don't, you have a bulletin insert with the passage and also it will be scrolling up here on the screen as I read it through. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. This is God's word. Let's pause and let's pray before we move forward. Father, we thank you for this new year. And we thank you that your, your mercies and your kindness to us um, is always fresh and new. Thank you that we, uh, we, we're only still here alive because you have chosen that you still have us here. So thank you for your grace in that. Thank you for your grace in the scriptures and that we get to look at the lives of these men and women of faith from so long ago. Father, we pray that you lead us. We pray that you empower us. We pray that you open our hearts. And I pray that you lead me in each thing that I say this morning, that it will be helpful and that it will be true. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I mentioned, all right, so in the fall, we went through Genesis 1 through 11. And, it, and if you remember, if you're just familiar with Genesis 1 through 11, it deals with kind of big worldwide themes. So we've got the creation of the earth. We've got the fall of mankind that impacts everyone. We have a worldwide flood. We have the Tower of Babel that talks about the scattering of the nations and the confusing of the languages. And then what we have in Genesis 12 through 50 is we have sort of a different focus. The focus really narrows significantly. And instead of looking at the entire world, we're looking at the forming of one nation. We're looking at the early ancestors of what would become the nation of Israel. And it goes through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and then all of Jacob's sons. And in the end, and you'll see this in part of our passage here, but what we end up seeing is it's not that God has looked at the world and said, all right, forget the world, I'll just try with one family. It's God looking to spread his fame and his light to the world, but he's gonna choose to do it primarily through one nation that begins with one family that really goes all the way back to beginning with one man, Abraham. And if you're familiar with the Bible, or even if you aren't, Abraham's a pretty famous person in the Bible, 
pretty well-known person, and he's associated most with one quality. When you think of Abraham, the quality that you think of is faith. Abraham is the man of faith. And this is the case in the New Testament also. In fact, let me pull up some passages from the New Testament that connect the life of Abraham to the life of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, Abraham went. Romans chapter four, verse 20, the the context of this is talking about Abraham and the promise that even in his old age, he would have a child. It says, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. And then finally, Galatians 3, 7 connects Abraham's faith to our faith when it says, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. And and if you're familiar with Galatians, what's going on here is that the apostle Paul is saying, all of us, Jews and Gentiles, we all are children of Abraham if we are exercising faith in the God of Abraham in the God who speaks light into darkness, in the God who makes promises and keeps those promises. Abraham was a man of faith. And a lot of what we're going to see in his life through the next several weeks, as we look at him in Genesis, is going to be centered around what it looks like to walk by faith. Now, one of the things that's talked a lot about a lot in our culture today is is sort of the, the contrast between faith and reason. It's sort of like, all right, you have people that live by evidence and that live by facts, and then you have people of faith. And sometimes we even use that terminology when we're thinking of sort of political things, all right, that there are people of faith and there are faith-based organizations. And what we end up thinking of faith is that faith is blind, faith is foolish, faith is irrational. Faith is when you stop thinking, stop looking around, and just believe something that you want to be true. That is not the biblical idea of faith at all. Faith is not blind. Faith is not stupid. Faith is not irrational. But faith is a gamble. Faith is when you look with completely open eyes at the things around you and you make a gamble, you take a risk. Faith is not blind, it's not irrational, it's not stupid, but it is always risky. And what we're gonna see in this opening passage through Abraham is that walking with faith, uh, walking with God requires risky faith. There's no way to walk with God without taking a gamble. And the thing that we get to see in Abraham's life is we get to see that when you walk with risky faith, there are certain things that you have to leave behind. Now, now let me just say a couple things before we start walking through this passage and see what it is that we need to leave behind. Um, We all are called to walk by faith. And so as we see Abraham, we get to look at an example. We get to look at somebody who lived with a risky faith. And and again, I just want to draw our attention. Some of you kind of laughed when I said New Year's resolutions because you're like, ah, New Year's resolutions, who cares? That's dumb. Uh, The only people who do that are the people who want to be disappointed a month later when they haven't followed through on their New Year's resolutions. Um, And and I understand kind of the skepticism about New Year's resolutions. Uh, But from my perspective, for those of us who are believers in Jesus, any societal point that points us towards an opportunity for reflection and reevaluation of how we're living is a good time. It's always the right time for us to look at our lives and say, is God calling me to something new? Is God calling me to something different? Is, it, is there some habit that I've got into that it's time for that to go because that's been keeping me from what God has for me? Or is there some new habit that I need to get into my life because otherwise I won't hear the voice of God clearly? And so as we look at this new year and and as some of us are taking time to reevaluate, this is a great time for us to ask the question, what are the risky steps of faith that God is calling me to and what is going to empower me to take those risks? So as we walk through this passage, we'll see some things that Abraham had to leave behind in order to walk the risky path of faith. And we'll just walk through them one by one. But the first one that we're going to see is that in order to walk by faith, Abraham had to leave behind familiarity. 
And this goes right into the opening command, the opening statement in verse one. Verse one says, the Lord said to Abram. Um, now, now, before even seeing what he said, let's just pause here and take this in. First of all, I've talked a lot about Abraham already. Did you notice that Abraham is not in this passage? Abraham is never named in this passage. Abraham is never named in the Bible until Genesis 17, when God changes his name from Abram to Abraham, which is something that God does at different times. He changes a person's name because Abraham means father of many. And so even at that point, Abraham still didn't have Isaac, his son, but it was a part of the promise. Even though you don't see it right now, Abraham, you're going to be the father of many. You're going to have descendants that number as great as the stars of the sky. The name Abram that he was born with means exalted father. Now, the irony to this is if you know a little bit, if you were to go back just a few verses and read the end of Genesis 11, you'd see that Abram doesn't have any children. Abraham as, we, Abraham, as we'll see, he's 75 years old. His wife is 65 years old. They have not been able to have any children. And we don't have a lot of other background about Abram, but we do have one thing that's said by Joshua. In Joshua chapter 24, after Joshua leads the people of Israel into the land that was promised to them, he calls them to look back at their ancestry. And in Joshua 24 verse two, he says this. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and worshiped other gods. Now, Joshua doesn't say for absolute certain that Abraham was in on that worship also. So, so let's just, let, let's stay ambiguous at this point. Maybe Abraham rejected all of that, but either way, he was part of an idol worshiping family. In fact, a lot of people think that the, the specific God that they worshiped um, in their region because of the God that was worshiped in that region during that time was the moon God. And in fact, Abram's wife, Sarai, her name is later changed to Sarah, but Sarai, a lot of people think the way that that name is formed points towards one of the daughters of the, of the moon God. So they were probably steeped in idol worship. So just, uh, I wanted to pause here because of this. Sometimes we can get into our heads, God could never use me. Like I'm just, I'm really ordinary or I've made a lot of mistakes in my lives or, or I just, you know, my family isn't the right kind of family. I didn't grow up in the right setting. God is speaking to a 75 year old man whose family is idolatrous. You are not beyond the reach of God and you are not beyond being somebody who God uses profoundly in the world. This is the beginning of the story. God speaking into darkness. We, we had Genesis 1, the whole story begins with there's darkness and God speaks light. And then when we get to the next major transition in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 12, we have God speaking light into the darkness of an idolatrous family by calling out one of the members. Verse one says that he said to Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. In other words, Abram, leave behind everything you're familiar with and go to a place, and I'm not even gonna tell you where you're going yet. I'll eventually show you where you're going, but for now, just trust me that I will land you in a place that you will end up. Now this is, is a bold call for anyone. Leave behind everything that you're familiar with and move to a new home. But in the 21st century, I don't think we quite get it because most of us have moved. Many of us have lived in different states and we've moved away from our, our family of origin. We're not living in the same spot. Some of you are, but, but a lot of us have moved away. Um, seven years ago, Karina and I moved our family down here from Oregon. We'd lived up in Oregon for eight years. Um, we were around her extended family up there. We were around the community that she'd grown, grown up with and we'd made great friends there. And we moved down here um, so that I could take the position here at this church. And when we did that, we'll, we'll just say, like, that was a risk. That was a step of faith. That was a step away from the familiarity of what we had up there. We didn't know anybody in this church other than the people that we'd met while I'd been candidating. So, so it was kind of a risk. It was from something that was familiar to something that was unfamiliar. And at the same time, it's moving from Oregon to California. 
Um, it, it's still on the West Coast. There's a lot of similarities. And I'd grown up in California. I mean, not here exactly, but, but kind of close enough. I, I knew a lot of what to expect. And one of the things I knew that I could expect was in and out. And so that helped also. <laughs> Just to be honest, you know, I, I knew, all right, I'm going back to a place with a lot less rain, a lot more sunshine and in and out. So it's probably going to be good. Um, and also, just think about this. As soon as we moved down here, any time we wanted, we could still contact the people we'd left behind. We've got the internet. We've got social media. We've got phones. We can reconnect with them anytime we want. In fact, if we want to see them, it just takes a two hour plane ride. We live in an age where it's easy to reconnect that way. And not only that, but one of the things that we did when, when we knew we were still up in Oregon and we knew that we were going to be moving down, um, my, my wife checked Google Earth to be able to look at the neighborhoods in the area. Now just think about what we're able to do in our age right now. We had a good idea of what to expect. We knew what kind of climate it was. We knew how much houses cost. We knew a lot of the professions that were gonna be had around here. We were able to figure out a lot and get some level of familiarity before we moved. So we could say, yeah, it was a step of faith. It was a bold step of faith in following Jesus. And it was, but it wasn't all that difficult. Think of what Abram and his family are doing here. People in the ancient Near East, they did not move away from their community. They did not move away from their family. And that's not just because it, 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 they loved their family. It, it was also because it was unsafe to move away from your community and your family. You didn't know what to expect out there. This was your safety. This was your security. This was your family. This was your protection. This was everything that you were familiar with. And when Abram goes, he doesn't have any expectation that he is going to be in contact with these people again. And what is he going to do? He's got no email. He's got no FaceTime. He's going to give somebody a letter on a camel and get it back to them. And then three years later, I mean, he is really leaving things behind here. This is a profound step of faith that he is being called to make. It is incredibly risky. And so without even reading any more, we can say, all right, well, God's telling him to go, but why would he go? This seems like a really hard thing to do. And in verses two and three, we get some insight into why Abram would think it was worth going because God made some promises to him. I will make you into a great nation. Now, just right there, we get something about the promises of God. In fact, in, in the promises to Abraham, people usually narrow it down and say, all right, there's a lot of things that God promises, promised to Abraham, but, but there's three big categories. There's land, there's offspring, and there's blessing. Those are the three big categories. So land, we already saw in verse one, God doesn't tell him what land, but he says, go to a place I will show you. You, you are going to land somewhere. So he gives them a promise of land. Here in verse two, he gives them the beginnings of the promise of offspring. I will make you into a great nation. Now for a 75 year old childless man, you could see why this would be a pretty exciting promise. There's gonna be a whole nation that's gonna come from me. In fact, if you look at the last thing in verse three, the very final promise that was given, he says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And in English, we could look at that and say, well, that could just mean that Abram is going to have such an impact on people around him that all sorts of people are going to experience blessing and benefits in their lives because of the life that he lives. But in the Hebrew, it's much more specific. It's really talking more about the idea that everyone is going to be blessed through something that's going to come from his body, through him, through a descendant, all of the people of the earth are going to be blessed. You've got the promise of land, you've got the promise of offspring, and then you can see it throughout verses two and three, the promise of blessing. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And it's important because as the story of Abraham unfolds, you do see material blessing come to his life. You do see God showing his faithfulness through Abraham experiencing material wealth at different times of his life. But the main element of the blessing here is not you are going to be rich. The main area of the blessing is impact. 
there is going to be impact and you will experience that impact from God in your life and others will experience that impact through your life. Scripturally, to live a blessed life sometimes does mean that God gives us great temporary gifts right in the here and now. But God's blessings are far beyond the idea that he just gives us a little bit in the here and now. It's that our lives have impact. It's that we get the joy of walking with God while all of this is happening and that we're walking in the hope of the promises he gives. So Abram decides to go. He takes the call of God, even though it's leaving behind everything that's familiar uh, to him. And the reason he's able to do it is because he has profound promises. And so before moving on to the next section, let's just pause here and take stock of ourselves. Leaving behind familiarity is really difficult. There are some of you who probably, you you like adventure and you like to try new things and maybe you've moved around a lot and you're looking at your life and saying, oh, I can just, you know, every two years I can just move to a new spot and move to a new spot and move to a new spot. Um, God bless you if that's you. Most of us are not that way. And I'm going to guess, even if you're kind of that way, you, you still resonate with the idea that as human beings, we, we crave the idea of being settled. We crave the idea of having somewhere that we can call home and having familiarity and sort of knowing what to expect from life and having life be to some extent predictable. We crave familiarity and God calls Abram away from all of his familiarity. You know, in three weeks, we're going to be up here talking about um, Go Team Sunday, our, our global outreach Sunday, where we talk about what God is calling us as Life Bible Fellowship Church to do in partnering with the gospel spreading to the nations. And part of what we do, we always give forth the invitation, is God calling you to leave behind the familiarity of your life for a week or for 10 days or or for two weeks, however long it is, is God calling you to leave behind this familiarity to go and be part of something that he's doing in another place? And you're going to receive that call. But let me just also throw this out. Those of us who who are pastors and elders here, we are convinced that part of the way that God is going to move in our church family is not only to raise up people who are going to say, I'll leave behind familiarity for a week. I'll leave behind familiarity for a weekend. I'll go for 10 days. But that there are people here that God is going to raise up to go cross culturally to serve Jesus for the long term, for a year, for two years, for five years, for an undetermined amount of time because God calls us away from our familiarity. And there are probably people in this room that God is going to call you away from the familiarity of the United States to serve him cross-culturally. And beyond even that, we all know you don't need to actually go on a mission trip or go overseas in order to step out of the familiarity. Some of you right now are in a life group, and I'm, believe me, I, I'm not going to say it specifically, but some of you are in a life group, and if you were to look around your life group, you would realize there are about five people that could lead a life group in your life group. Some of you are going to be called to leave behind the familiarity of that group to start something new that God is at work in. For some of you, leaving behind familiarity is just going to mean that there's a really uncomfortable conversation that you need to have with someone because you see something bad happening in their life and as a good brother or sister, you need to talk to them about it. And you've been soaking in the familiarity of avoiding conflict, but God is gonna call you to step out of this. This is what God constantly does. This isn't just a story with Abraham. God constantly calls his people to take the risky step of faith of leaving behind familiarity and walking towards what we're gonna see next in Abraham's story uncertainty. Because if you're going to walk the risky walk of faith, you're going to have to leave behind familiarity. And the second thing that you're going to have to leave behind is you're going to have to leave behind clarity. Now, let me just real quick explain what I mean by this, because you could look at that and say, well, well, so when I'm walking by faith, I I, I don't have God's promises to bank on. I don't know who God is. I'm unclear about the world. That's not what I mean at all. We hold on to the promises of God. We hold on to what's revealed about God. But even though we walk forward in the clarity of who God is and what he's promised, we walk forward in a lot of uncertainty about how exactly God is going to make things roll out before us. 
So Abram is told, I'm gonna give you a land, I'm gonna give you offspring, I'm gonna bless you. But he's also told, go and I'll tell you later. He's given uncertainty. And that's what we see in the following verses. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. And and so just as a quick note, God says, leave behind your father's household and your family. And apparently what ended up happening is Abram said to his family, I'm going to go where God has told me to go. And a few of them said, we want to go too. So Abram is not doing kind of a half measure here. He's not saying, well, I'm going to go, but I'm going to bring people with me. He's saying, I'm going to go regardless of what anybody else is going to do. And his wife says, I'm in. And his nephew says, I'm in. And there's a bunch of the household servants that come along also. So he brings all of them and they end up in the land of Canaan which ends up being the land that God promises to the people of Israel. It's not clear at this point if God said sort of head in this direction and and just kind of go this way, or if God said, go to Canaan and then I'll catch up with you there. We're not clear, but he ends up in Canaan. And then we read this in verse six. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So here's why I want you to follow me on this because it's gonna be a little bit complicated. So Abram goes to Canaan, and you know who's there? The Canaanites. All right, so far, so good. Reading this, we're like, all right, this is like the least profound thing ever. He goes to Canaan, there are Canaanites here. Here's why this matters. We end up finding out later, this is the land. God promised him a land, this is the land. This is where the Israelites end up. In fact, in the very next verse, God is going to tell him, this is the land. But Abram shows up to the land he was promised, And it's not unoccupied. He can't plant a flag and say, this is now my land. There are Canaanites in the land. The land is occupied during that time. It is not yet ready for him. And this is one of the powerful things about faith. It's it's easy for us to talk about walking by faith if we've already seen the fulfillment of what was promised. But most of our lives are lived in this in-between. Back here, we have the promises God has made. And somewhere out in the future, we have the fulfillment of that. And we live here in the lack of clarity about how exactly it's going to go. So Abram could have said, I'm clear that he promised the land. I'm clear that he promised me descendants. I'm clear that he promised me blessing. But I am really unclear on how all of this is going to shake out. Because I'm here in the land and it's occupied. Um, I, I don't recommend spending a lot of money on gambling, but, uh, but I like to play poker with my friends. So we're just putting that out there. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's very low stakes. It's all just for fun. But um, the, there's, some, there's something fun that happens when you get to play poker because there, there's a little stakes. Even if you're just playing for a few dollars, there's a little bit of that sense of risk of like, all right, I'm, I'm putting something on the line here. I'm taking the risk. I'm taking a gamble. And so there are very few times when you're playing poker that you have a hand that you know for sure is the winning hand. There's very few times when that happens. By the way, when it happens, it's really fun. (laughs) It's really great. But most of the time, if you're deciding to play your hand, you have a hand that you're like, all right, this hand is pretty good. I think there's a good chance I'm going to win with this hand, but I'm not going to be sure until the end. And you don't get to just go through and see everybody's cards before you put out your bet. You have to gamble. You have to say, all right, I'm going to bet on the idea that this hand is going to come through. And one of the loneliest, tensest moments is after you've revealed your cards and you know what you've got, but you're waiting for the opponent's cards to flip over so that you can figure out if you've won or if you've lost. Because if you've played a little bit of, uh, of poker, you've had both experiences. You've had the glorious victories and then you've had the shocking defeats where you're like, oh, I swear I had that. I had the ace high flush, but then this guy comes forward with a straight flush. Hypothetically, um, things like that happen sometimes. So you've had the times where you've won and lost and you're living in that in between. You're waiting for the cards to be turned over to find out was this a good gamble or not. Our lives are lived in the time where we're waiting for the cards to be flipped over. We don't know for sure. 
We know God's promises. We're waiting for the fulfillment. We don't know yet where this stands. Abram doesn't yet know where this stands. In fact, I'll say this. The greatest promise that those of us who are believers in Jesus await is the return of Jesus. And you know when that's going to happen? No. You don't know when that's going to happen. We are living in the uncertain in-between. One of the great promises, it, in some ways maybe the greatest promise that we're given in the New Testament is Romans eight twenty eight. We are told, God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Everything happening in your life right now, all the difficulty, all the uncertainty, God is working that for your good. But you don't know exactly how that's gonna happen. You don't know how that's gonna shake out. We, we read that verse and we're like, that means I'm gonna get the job, Maybe. Maybe not. That means my marriage is going to be tight and smooth and, and just really, really good. Maybe, probably not. Probably there's going to be at least difficulties and maybe real sharp difficulties. In it. This means we're always going to have enough money. Probably not. This means we're not going to experience health problems. Probably not. God doesn't promise us the life of ease. God promises that he's working all things for our good. So when we live the life of faith, we live in that uncertainty of not sure, not sure, not sure how this is gonna go. And in the end, I have God's promises, but I've still got to bet on him. I've still got to trust him that in the end, this will work for my good, even if the short term, it doesn't seem to be going that way. When we walk by faith, we have to leave behind clarity. And finally, what, what we see in the last section is when we walk by faith, we leave behind futility. And what I mean by futility is just the hopelessness and despair that sometimes can come along with uncertainty. There's some of you in this room that are kind of uh, more given to be optimists and some of you that are more given to be pessimists. So with the optimists, you're, you're usually the ones looking at the situation. You're like, it's all going to work out. It's all going to be fine. I mean, they're, they're going to the doctor, but the doctor's going to come back and say, it's negative. It's all okay. I mean, the job is up in the air, but I'm going to get the job. And, and maybe sometimes your danger is that you start to believe God has promised things that he's never promised. But the danger of the pessimist, or as we like to call ourselves, realists, <laughs> which I say ironically, because how arrogant do you have to be to say, I'm a realist? The pessimist doesn't expect everything to work out. And in fact, some of us get a weird rush over things going badly for us because then that allows us the indulgence of self-pity. That allows us to look at other people and things are going well with them and say, they don't know what it's like. They've had an easy life. They haven't had all the knocks that I've had through life. There is a sense when we're living in the uncertainty where we can begin down the road to self-pity and despair. That is not the walk of faith. And the joy of what we see in verses seven through nine is at that point of uncertainty, God speaks a reminder. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. He promised him land and even now he gets a little bit more specific. I'm gonna give you this land. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Abram responds in worship and remembrance. God makes a promise. Abram responds in worship. And I'm, I'm never gonna, I'm gonna build an altar here so that I always remember that God's word is true. God made his promise. I can bank on that. But then I want you just to look at what happens next because the next two verses to me are even more profound than verse seven. It says, from there, he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on his west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So we've got two altars in these verses. And the first time the sequence is this. Abram builds an altar right after God appears to him. Then in verse eight, Abram builds an altar right after what? Right after nothing. There's no appearance here. There's no God showing up and saying, yeah, I'm still gonna follow through on my promises. Abram is walking the uncertain path of faith, but now he's walking it with hope. He's looking back at a past appearance and saying, you know what? God was faithful there. I'm going to continue to worship God here, even though I didn't get another appearance. In fact, look at how the passage ends in verse nine. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. 
this opening passage about Abram isn't a passage about him landing on God's promises. It's about him beginning a life of wandering and waiting for God's promises. Because a life of faith is when we live faithfully and trusting God in between when the promise is given and when the promise is fulfilled. And that means that we leave behind the familiarity and the comfort that we experience, especially in the U.S., We say, you know what? That's not what my life is about. And so if that means me stepping out and going on a short-term team, I'm gonna do that. If that means me asking questions about how generous I need to be, you know, I'll I'll do that. If that means me looking at the, the big picture of conversations that I need to have and the ways that I need to approach conflict, I'll do that because the faith, the walk of faith is always a risky walk. And it means that you leave behind clarity, that you say, all right, I'm gonna walk forward following God and I'm not exactly sure how it's gonna shake out. I know God is faithful, I'm banking on that, I'm gambling on him, but I don't know exactly all the steps along the way. In fact, a lot of you probably know that passage in Psalms that says, your word is a lamp unto my feet. And it's a great verse, but just think about this. If God's word is a lamp unto our feet, then you know what it shows us? the next step. You know what else it shows us? Nothing. You get the next step and you trust God that he's gonna be with you along the way. And walking the risky path of faith means also that we leave behind our self-indulgent hopelessness, our pessimism that everything's gonna go wrong because in the end, we have a God who speaks light into darkness, who speaks order into chaos, and who brings beauty into ruinous situations. So when it comes to us, let me give you two ways that we get to look at Abraham. And the first way is this, Abraham is our example. There's just no way around it. He's a great example of walking by faith. He leaves behind the familiarity of what he had. He walks by faith. We're called to do similar things. It's not always gonna look the same, but we're called to leave behind our familiarity just as he did. He is a great example of faith. That's the first way to look at Abraham. But there's a second way that's just as important, and that's this. God said to Abraham, all people of the earth will be blessed through you. So when we look back at Abraham, we're not just saying he walked by faith so that I could follow his his example. We get to say he walked by faith, and because of that, we are blessed. We experience blessing because of what somebody else did a long time ago. And God was faithful to his promises and Abraham had a son named Isaac. And Isaac had a son named Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons who were the tribes of Israel. And then several generations down the line, there was a man who was born named David. And he became the great king of Israel. And several generations down the line from that, a man was born who was a descendant of David and that man was Jesus. And Jesus, in even a greater way than Abraham, left behind the familiarity of his home. He left behind the ultimate comfort, the ultimate glory, in order to come and sacrifice himself so that others could be blessed through him. And here's why I emphasize, here's why this is so important. God is probably moving in you right now. And it's important that we're attentive to the idea God God is moving among us. He's moving in us to take risky steps of faith. And it's scary. And sometimes we're going to say yes. And sometimes we're going to say no. And and we're going to strive to follow him in these difficult, unfamiliar steps of faith. But if you are a believer in Jesus, here's what I want you to know. Your obedience or disobedience to that step of faith that God is calling you to, your eternal destiny does not depend on that. Your eternal destiny does not depend on some heroic act of faith that you do today. It depends on a heroic act of faith that was done 2,000 years ago. We ride the coattails of Jesus to glory. There is nothing that we could do to bring ourselves into a point where we would be worthy of God's attention. But there was something that was already done by Jesus to bring you into the family of God when he died for our sins and when he conquered death through the resurrection. So it's no less urgent that we follow these steps of faith, but don't follow them as a slave. Don't look at the call to faith right now and say, boy, I better do this or God is just gonna be really, really mad. I better do this or I might be kicked out. I better do this or I might go to hell. That's not the call for believers in Jesus. The call for believers in Jesus is much more like this. 
how much of God's presence in your life do you want to experience? How much of God's blessing toward you and through you do you want to experience? How awake do you want to be to what's really going on in the world? We get to follow the call of faith, not through slavish obedience, but by joyous trust as we take the risky steps of faith that God is calling us to. In a moment, I'm gonna pray to to close our time. But before I do that, let, let me just say, this is a good time for us to look at the steps of faith God is calling us to. And after I finish, there's gonna be some folks up here to your right who are gonna be available to pray with you. There's gonna be some of us outside who will be available to do the same. And if right now you're sensing, I know God's calling me to do something and man, I'm petrified. Man, I'm, I'm scared. It's risky. I don't know what to do about it. Don't go it alone. Find a brother or sister to pray with you about that, to be in that battle with you because Satan would love for you to walk out of this room and say, no, nah, probably not. No, nah, God probably didn't want me to do that. Partner with brothers and sisters who will share your faith in what God is calling you to do. So let me pray for us now. Father, thank you that you've given us grace in Jesus. Thank you that you've called us to risky steps of faith. Give us the power and the faith to follow through on what you've called us to do. We pray in the name of our great savior, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>